welcome to your english class children in our syllabus we have now two things to do one is this poetry the chimney sweeper by william blake and the other one is a prose piece now this chimney sweeper is a very beautiful poem it's one of the poems really close to my heart so before we directly delve into the poem itself let us understand the background in which this poem was written by william blake the poem was first published in the songs of innocence now the songs of innocence was blake's first version of this narrative poem and the theme was about the young chimney sweepers of europe now when i when i talk about chimney sweepers the first thing if you close your eyes it will be chimneys not the kind of chimneys that we use but generally the one which we see in old english movies and since chimneys were what they were basically vents through which the ash the soot was it acted like an exhaust was taken out of the household so naturally the chimney needed cleaning over and over again and europe being quite a temperate or quite a cold place the northern parts of europe this became a very popular employment i wouldn't say employment it became a very popular work at this point of time now these chimney sweepers were very very young which is the reason why the poet was quite concerned about them and decided to write about them because these people the authors the poets they are very influential and we always know that the pen is mightier than the sword so as you can see on your left is the cover of songs of innocence and look how beautifully illustrated the chimney sweeper is this is like a, one of the drafts of chimney sweeper and this is how it looked now the chimney sweeper the poem is set against the dark background of child labor this terrible practice was prevalent in england in the late 18th and 19th centuries very young boys were sold off i mean they were as young as 4 or 5 years old to clean the chimneys this inconsiderate act took place to facilitate the cleaning procedure you can look at one of the chimneys with the photograph on the right look at the twisted design of the chimney or even the one which is standing rectangularly can you see that how narrow they were so naturally the small size of these children and obviously for a person who is of my age and consider a person of your age and consider a person who is your sibling a very small child the flexibility of the body also is better the more young you are so their small size and flexibility accounted for the cleanest of chimneys no matter how the chimney looked whether it was straight and easy to go and whether it was twisted and curved and difficult to slide through but the size and the flexibility of the children were a real matter of consideration the large houses created by the wealth of wealth and the trade they had these you know huge rooms there were palatial rooms at that point of time and there were several chimneys and the chimneys needed to be lit constantly and cleaned constantly and they could be cleaned only by a small child crawling through them so basically these chimneys literally became black coffins because there were so many little boys little as i told you as young as 4 or 5 year old who met their death while providing this kind of service 
If you can look at the photograph on the left, you will see that there is a man so big when he is standing and the little child who is standing atop the chimney, more or less they are of the same height. And I am sure this adult is giving a good scolding to the little one. I don't know for what mistake he has done. But this photo is of is hundreds of years old. But can you see the misery that has perpetuated from that time till today? I am quite certain that no one in their proper frame of mind would look at this photo and just laugh it off. There is a tinge, a sense of misery that has passed from that era to this one. Now, when we talk about these children, as we look at these children, what can we see? Of course, the children were oppressed and they had a terrible existence. They had no rights whatsoever. And what was life? Life was just a process of inhalation and exhalation. They were breathing. That is why they were alive. So, they existed. I cannot use the word that since they were breathing, they were living. They lived. No, I can't use the word lived for them. Because if you are living a life, that means there is some positivity about it. But for these children who were deprived of all rights, access to anything, health, sanitization, education, proper food, love, care, you cannot call that a life. So, and at that, that point of time in England, this was socially accepted. Ah, yes, this is what happens. No one raises an eyebrow. Just like sometimes when you see a stray dog. In some places, stray dogs are like, okay, fine, there are still stray dogs on the road. They haven't been picked up and neutered. And in some places in India, stray dogs are all right. No one gives, I mean, no one gives them a second look. No one is bothered about them because that is so normal. So, at that point of time, in that era, the existence of the small children working day and night without any hours, basically specified hours and at such terrible conditions, was a socially accepted norm. The children in this field of work were often unfed, being having no access to money and please do not remain under the you know, uh, false notion that they were paid after they were, they had done their job. No, they did not get paid. So without food, without money, obviously they could not afford to be properly clothed also. In most cases, the children made their woeful end from either falling through the chimneys or from lung damage or from several other horrible diseases as they worked constantly breathing in the suit. So can you now understand why Blake chose this particular subject? Since he knew his pen was mightier than the sword, he wanted the people to realize that the boy who is cleaning the chimney at your home, no, we are not supposed to do that. He is a human being. He is a little boy just like your own son who is enjoying the warmth of the hearth. So please, this, this has to stop now. Before we go any further, let me just read the poem for you once. And this one, which was first published for in Songs of Innocence. It says, When my mother died, I was very young. And my father sold me while yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 weep. So your chimneys I sweep and in suit I sleep. There's little Tom Dacre who cried when his head that curled like a lamb's back was shaved. So I said, hush Tom, never mind it. For when your head is bare, you know that the suit cannot spoil your white hair. And so he was quiet. And that very night, as Tom was sleeping, he had such a sight. But that thousands of sweepers like Dick, Joe, Ned, Jack, 
were all of them locked up in coffins of black. And by came an angel who had a bright key that he opened the coffins and set them all free. Then down a green plain, leaping, laughing, they run and wash in a river and shine in the sun. Then naked and white, all their bags left behind, they rise upon the clouds and sport in the wind. And the angel told Tom, if he'd be a good boy, he'd have God for his father and never want joy. And so Tom awoke and we rose in the dark and got on with our bags and our brushes to work. Though the morning was cold, Tom was happy and warm. So if all do their duty, they need not fear harm. Now we move on to the first stanza. This is an actual photograph of a small little young boy who by profession, unpaid profession mind you, was a chimney sweeper. See, the poem starts in first person and it is about a very young chimney sweeper who exposes the evils of chimney sweeping as a part of the cruelties created by the sudden increase of wealth. Because at this point of time, you see, you had the industrial revolution going on. The people who were successful, they had a lot of money in their hand. And of, of course, they what would they do? They would build, build plush houses with acres and acres of land. And there they would be employing other people while a section of the society was trying very hard to ration their food. So, when my mother died, I was very young. So, my mother, I, the first line creates a big impact. Motherless? It's like the roof is taken off your head and on a very, very stormy day. So these children, let's come back to these children again. Uh, they were either orphans or were sold by poor parents to master sweep, sweepers. So there was a chain, a racket, a person who was running the entire organization of having these small children work for him. He would send the children just like car rentals here. There have a lot of cars. And of course, if whatever you require a small wagon hour, you require an Innova, I will send it to you accordingly. You pay me and I will disburse the funds accordingly. But oh yes, I am the one who is making the lion's share of the profit. So these children were either orphans or were sold by poor parents or they were probably found somewhere at the corner of the road, cold, bare, a hungry, a waif, a young waif. So here also, when this child's mother died, I was very young and my father sold me while yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 weep. So here it's happened sort of in both ways this child was affected. His mother was no longer there. A mother even, she will go without food to put one grain of or one morsel of food in the mouth of the child. With due respect to all fathers, this one was not uh, an exemplary father, of course, I must say, because maybe due to dearth of any money, maybe he was driven to such extreme poverty that he was bound to sell his little one to a master sweeper. And you know, children, Sometimes they were sold for as less as two guineas. A, a man's life, a, a human life worth that. And today we call you the future of the world. Because children, you, you are the future. So what's the worth of a future? Two guineas. Now as I told you, they suffered from cancers caused by the uh, suit. And occasionally... The little children, terrified of this terrible darkness, once they got into the chimneys, got lost within them. And then what happened? They would fall down, they would die, sometimes just their 
remains were what was discovered. Anyway, now let's just leave that grotesque part. So this poem opens with a little boy narrating, as I told you, it's a narrative poem, narrating the story of his miserable life as well as telling sad tales of other chimney sweeper boys. The little boy narrates that he was very young when his mother died. He was then sold off by his father to a master sweeper. As I am telling you, since we are no one to judge parents, I would give the father a slight benefit of doubt and say that assumably he was driven by extreme poverty to take the step that he did. And now this boy's age was so tender, he was so young that he could not even pronounce the word sweep. Why would he have to say that? Because often when you are um, in your home, sometimes a vendor who passes by in your colony, he has to shout out about the things like if it is winter and a Kashmiri person is selling his wares, he would be shouting Kaleen, shawl and things like that. It is that what is going to attract you. Otherwise, no one is sitting on their stairs trying to figure out when the vegetable vendor would come or when my Kashmiri uh, vendor would come. So they shout, uh, uh, making themselves public that, yes, I am near your home at your service and this is the service that I am able to provide you. So this child would have to say sweep 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 so if I, if my chimney needs a bit of sweeping i would run outside and i would tell the child that wait i need your services so his age was he was so young that he could not even pronounce the word sweep properly and of course living such a miserable life he would cryingly pronounce it as weep and naturally this despondent life made him actually weep, realizing the condition that he was in. The pun intended through the word weep so many times. In the third line of the opening stanza, it holds a pathetic significance. Most chimney sweepers like him were so young that their tongues were not, you know, developed enough to produce the word sweep and therefore their lips lisped weep and this children also for those of you who are um, interested in history this kind of a treatment for the class the have-nots the people who were not rich the poorer class this gave rise actually to major revolutions this we can say the french revolution is a classic example of this so Welcome back children. We were doing the chimney sweeper written by William Blake. Children, the last day we had been introduced to this tiny little being burdened with the huge responsibility of trudging along bearing the heavy load of his blackened life. This little boy who is a chimney sweeper he says that since that tender age when he was sold off to this miserable fate, he is used to sweeping the chimneys and he sleeps at night, his body soot smeared and he does not even have the privilege to wash himself. He says, so your chimneys I sweep and in soot I sleep. So his entire life is complete blackness. Today, we proceed with the second stanza. There's little Tom Dacker, who cried when his head that curled like a lamb's back was shaved. So I said, Hush, Tom, never mind it, for when your head's bare, you know that the suit cannot spoil your white hair. So, when I think of Tom Dacker, this is the kind of a boy <clears throat> who comes to my mind. I mean, when I was looking for a picture of Tom Dacker, this one seemed to bit, uh, fit the bill so beautifully. So, in the second stanza, the narrator tells us the woeful tale of Tom Dacker. 
Now, this is a very famous character in Blake's poems. Tom was called Dacker because it belonged to Lady Dacker's almshouse. The inmates of this almshouse were foundling orphans. That is, they were, they were orphans and probably they were found abandoned in a street. Probably their parents did not want them anymore because of their poverty or something like that. The child was unwanted or maybe he did not have parents. He lost his parents in some way. So, and uh, one thing about Lady Dacker's almshouse was that here these orphans were allowed to be adopted by the poor people only. You must be knowing what an orphanage is. So, in an orphanage, there are many children. All the orphanage, the people, their objective is to give them a life better than the life they had been condemned to on the streets. And there are many people who desire to adopt a child. So, after, you know, looking uh, at the credentials of the prospective parents, if the parents can prove themselves worthy, the to-be parents, it's a joy for both sides. A couple gains a child and a child gains a mother's love, a father's warmth, a beautiful roof over his head. The orphanage has done a good job. But... The only thing about Lady Dacker's almshouse was the fact that no rich person could pick up a child from this orphanage. So keeping that in mind, we can say that it may be a foster father of Tom who had sold him to a master sweeper, thereby condemning him to a life of eternal misery. This is the closest image of Tom as I told you when it comes to mind when I try to imagine him. And look at his eyes. He is not happy. Well, no one is happy having his head shaved off. It, and it must be against his will. Though this painting shows him with brown hair, but actually he must have been a blonde one. Because if you see that where the light is coming from, we can see the soft blonde curls. And no one would really want to lose these beautiful hair. So we can only surmise that this is how a punishment was being meted out to him. And all this was taking place openly. It is here that the little narrator steps in. I mean, if this shaving of the head would have been taken place only in a room where only the person who was shaving the head was there and Tom, then the narrator's presence could not have been there. So it was an open punishment. God knows what this poor child had done. But it was an open punishment. So it is here that the little narrator steps in. Now, he is seasoned by life and has enough practical knowledge about life that this little one is in, a, in fact in a position to console the weeping Tom. When Tom wept as his head was being shaved, just as the back of a lamb is shaved for wool, as the soft curls fell about the weeping boy, the narrator counsels Tom not to weep and to keep his peace. He tries to find some positivity out of the painful situation by telling Tom, be calm, don't cry. For there are many reasons why it is better not to have such beautiful, wonderful soft locks as you are now in a very difficult profession. See, since you don't have the option of cleaning yourself every day with such a beautiful thick lock of hair, no lice will breed in the unkempt pate and nor will there be a risk of the hair to catch fire or even be dirtied by the suit. So see, the little child is explaining to an even younger Tom so beautifully when he is losing the hair that he loves. And if you have seen a sheep or a lamb when it curls against its mother, it's just like a round soft ball with the curly curly fleece that it has. So it's such a wonderful uh, expression that the poet has used to tell us or describe to us how beautiful the child's hair was. <laughs> Here the poet, however, may have pointed a finger at the societal norms. 
The shaving of the white curls indicate that now Tom no longer was the young, innocent boy. He was now thrust into a world where he had to suddenly grow up and fend for himself. Just imagine, a boy, four or five years old, what does he do? He just plays around. His mother fondles him. His father takes him on the lap. Sometimes he does. He is being taught how to eat. And at that stage, this poor little Tom, he had been forced into a world where he has to work like a professional and not a very easy task that to mind you. And if he cannot perform, then there is no one to tell him that it's all right, Tom. Rather, he might get a whip. So, this is how our second stanza ends. Then we come to the third stanza. And so he was quiet. Here he is Tom. And that very night, as Tom was sleeping, he had such a sight that thousands of sweepers, Dick, Joe, Ned and Jack, were all of them locked up in coffins of black. So, Though the little Tom was quietened by his adviser, yet the horrors of the day must not have left him easily, and the boy remained unusually quiet. This must be due to the shock, and soon he slipped into the comforting arms of slumber. And it is then that Tom has a dream. The dream starts in a very morbid fashion, where he sees many of his friends, like Dick, Joe, Ned, Jack. Now, these names were all very commonly used names of Victorian England. We don't know, since these were orphans, whatever their parents might have given them for names, I don't know, are, uh, very complicated names like Alexander or something like that. But since they were orphans, no one was there to tell Lady Dacre that this is the name of the child. So, a very common name was generally given to these children. So, what Tom was th uh, dreaming was that these boys are now lying dead in their coffins, which were made of black wood. So, till now, the tone of the poem is very, very, you know, negative. It's black and, and it's very morbid. Well, the sleeping quarters of the children were anyway no better. They were given small cubicles to sleep in. And if you remember, the chimneys themselves symbolized coffins which i had discussed the last day when we were we had started this poem chimney sweeper they symbolized coffins providing very little space to maneuver and often leading to the death of the little ones if any of you have seen a coffin you will see that it does not provide much space to move about because the occupant obviously doesn't need to move about it would be really scary if he did move about, except for Count Dracula, who used to move about there. Anyway, so they are very small and most of the coffins, working in the coffins actually led to the death of the children. So here the chimneys and the coffins stand for each other. They symbolize each other. And when a child, you see, entire existence is smeared by suit, it is natural that whatever his subconscious is perceiving, all of his dreams, everything is seen through a veil of black. Hence, the coffins of black, that is, the chimneys symbolizing suffocation, death, and everything that is bad about the lives of these little slaves. Moving on to the fourth stanza. Now here we find a little bit of something positive. When it says, And by came an angel who had a bright key, and he opened the coffins and set them all free. Then down a green plain, leaping, laughing they run, and wash in a river, and shine in the sun. For the first time in this entire poem, this is one stanza where things are happy, things are bright. There is some other color apart from black. So everything suddenly changes. There's a blinding flash of light. 
See, the hope of childhood refuses to yield to the serpentine and venomous black thoughts that the children actually are forced to live through every day of their lives. The typical religious boy, he sees an angel, the storm. From here, his dream seems to take a complete U-turn. He sees everything that is bright and clean, basically the exact opposite of his miserable life of slavery. There's a kind angel as opposed to the, to the harsh sweep master or master sweeper who has condemned him to virtual death. And this angel holds a key to freedom. It's a golden key and it's a beautiful thing. A key is supposed to release something. So he holds the key to freedom. The coffins are unlocked and the boys are now free. Freedom that not only eluded these children, but also was an impossibility. And now freedom is theirs. So what do the boys do? They leave their somber gray lives behind and dash into run into color and joyous existence. Now, when you will read this stanza, see that everything, I repeat, everything that the boys were living and the dream, even though they are symbolizing death in a coffin, it's the stark opposite of it. So let's analyze it now. They run down a green plane. Well, I would imagine that the boys would otherwise be moving rather slowly, dragging their heavy feet on the grey cobblestones of the English road and being very slow and careful with, with their movements when they are working in the black chimney. So what are the colours that we come across? Black, grey, etc. So, and the chimneys where death awaited them in every corner. You breathe the suit in, you fall down or whatever. Now, on the other hand, these people are blessed with the expanse of a plane. Instead of the small chimney, there is a huge plane. The first difference where they can run. They don't have to move slowly, cautiously and carefully. They can run. And the plane is green in color. And what does green symbolize? It is life. It is freshness. Again, as opposed to the black of the suit that symbolizes misery and death. And finally, they wash in a river. An endless supply of cool, clean water. A dream for the children who hardly have scope to bathe. And even if they do, probably they are just given a bucket to share. So, they wash themselves as if absolving them of all the sin and breaking away from the shackles of slavery. The children, their pure souls, shine in the warm sun. So, endless water, clean water, cool water warmed by the sun, exact opposite of the bathing water whenever they have it. And then there's the warm sun. The sun does not enter the chimney, but here they can see the sun. The chimneys are extremely cold. The English weather, if you, I mean, the warm sun is just a stark difference from the usual pallor of the rain-drenched English weather. That is very grey, cloudy, but here he, they see a warm and beautiful golden sun. It is indeed a delightful moment for the little chimney sweepers. And to us also, because we definitely like to see the boys being free from the shackles of bondage, labor, being exploited. Now they what they are doing? They are doing exactly what a child of their age is supposed to do. And it's an angel, a magical being from God who has come and made it all possible. Moving on to the fifth stanza. The naked and white, all their bags left behind, they rise upon the clouds and sport in the wind. We'll do it till here today. So, I'll cover the next four lines later. So, in this fifth stanza, this little boy, Tom, continue, sorry, this little boy, the narrator, 
he continues narrating the dream of Tom. All the little boys were naked and white after washing. They were naked, of course, because they had taken off their clothes before they went for a bath or a swim. But more importantly, naked here symbolizes purity and innocence. Their souls are now happy that they do not have to bear grudge or any unhappiness. Um, see, you can imagine a newborn baby. A newborn baby is the purest form of life on earth. And when it is born, of course, it does not come with clothes. It is naked. And it has no vices. It has no poor thoughts. It, uh, it does not bear any grudge against anyone. His soul is very, very poor, uh, pure. And so the usage of the word white, not because just that the skins of these English boys were fair, but, you know, um, they were fair skinned and it's not just that they are taking a bath and the suit is washed off and the white skin appears. It's not just that. But it is because that white again stands for innocence and purity. The children are no longer laborers now. They are now simply children, pure of heart and soul and are now doing what rightfully they should do. Be happy and enjoy life. Play, run. They are now so light in mind and body and soul that they rise upon the clouds. It reminds me uh, something off the topic. Don't we say that we are on cloud nine when we are extremely happy? So it's just like that. But let's not digress here. These children, they rise upon the cloud and sport in the wind. They are playing in the wind. They are so light. And why are they light? Because they are heavy bags, either containing the cleaning gear that they use to clean the chimneys, or when they come out of the chimneys, they have soot-filled pouches. They are also heavy. And now these children have neither, neither the gear nor the soot-filled pouches. So naturally, the boys feel as light as feather. But apart from that, it's because they are simply happy. The burden of misery has been lifted off their heart and soul and now they can breathe freely. They cast off the burden of life along with the bags of soot at the time of death riding the clouds and playing in the wind. So if you want to, you know, um, associate it with your own lives, if you have an altercation or a fight with your friend, your heart is heavy, you feel sad, you feel burdened. But the day you patch up with your friend and things are all right, don't you feel light at heart? That is what I mean to say that when the heaviness is off, lifted off the heart, they are no longer bonded laborers, even in death. They are light, they are happy and they are fleeting with the wind. The image of clouds floating freely is Blake's metaphor for the freedom from the material bondage of these little children's body and it has an important visual symbolism. We'll discuss. Welcome back children. Today we will be concluding the poem The Chimney Sweeper which we had started. I think the last time we met we had done till stanza 4 but we had not finished the entire stanza. So we were talking about Tom's dream where Tom had dreamt that he and some of his other co-workers they were all locked up in coffins of black and then an angel had come and liberated them. So the last day we had left the children leaping and laughing in the sun and cleaning themselves in a river with their bags left behind and they had been rising upon clouds and sporting in the wind. Now this cleaning as I had already told you is an act of religious purification because if you have seen even in a movie or read in a book that when a child is born and is Christian by faith Water is used during its baptism. So water has a holy significance. 
and shining in the sun can have two different connotations. Say for once, the little wet bodies of the children with the water droplets still clinging on to them may be sparkling as the sun reflects of those droplets. And on the other hand, it may also symbolize that since now these children are so close to God, they are shining like angels, that is, they are glowing. These children have now left their clothing and all their possessions, the bags and everything behind. Now, if you research, you will see that Victorian paintings or paintings of the Romantic era, which is the contemporary time that William Blake was, I mean, Blake's contemporary time, you will observe that for to depict angels, images of small boys with very pale skins were used. And what makes these children, children even more angelic is that they rise upon the cloud and play with the wind. Just like those paintings where the cherubs were depicted playing in the sky. Anyway, now we come to the remainder of the stanza. And the angel told Tom, if he'd be a good boy, he'd have God for his father and never want joy. Now, being a good boy can mean several things. It can mean that he could be a good chimney sweeper boy, doing his work properly and listening to instructions that have been given to him. He could also be a good little Christian boy, a religious boy who accepts everything that destiny has given him, served him with, with complete belief in his faith that yes, this has happened to me because God had wanted it to be. I don't have the option to study. I don't have parents. Well, this is all God's will. So maybe it can be a good boy like this. This child in all the sense of the word is an orphan, Tom. Now the angel says, that you don't have to worry now because God is your father and is looking after you since you're a good boy. And this children has a tremendous impact on a child who has never known parental love. And as for want of joy, it could mean that now he has so much joy in his life that he does not need any more joy. He will never be lacking joy. This is what they can mean. So, you see, the way through religion, these children are being influenced and they are being told to accept their fate without questioning. Now we come to the last stanza, which reads, And so Tom awoke, and we rose in the dark, the narrator is saying, and got with our bags and our brushes to work. Though the morning was cold, Tom was happy and warm. Now, though, T-H-O-U-G-H, since the poet, in order to maintain the rhyming sense of the stanza, he has not written the entire word, but has replaced U-G-H with an apostrophe. So, if all do their duty... They need not fear harm. Coming to the explanation. So Tom wakes up from his dream and they are all up and about on their jobs. It's early in the morning because chimney sweepers had to start very early in the morning. The bags which had disappeared in the dream have reappeared again before beside them. It is before sunrise and in England you can imagine how freezing it might be. A cold morning in England. But Tom was happy and warm. Now Tom is impervious to this biting cold. He is resistant to the dark and bleak morning. Nothing makes him miserable. His dream keeps him happy because in the dream he has been ensured by an angel representative of, a, of the God himself that he will now have a father, a father who will love him and protect him and who is that father he is the father 
that father our father who art in heaven he is god himself so what better can anyone ask for he is the all the mightiest the most powerful father that anyone could ever long for and he is now safe under the protection of such a father who is god himself now the last few lines if all do their duty they need not fear harm this is like a moral to the story at the first level you might ask that who is this all the poet is talking about now take it from the perspective of the little boys the angel had already told tom that he if he'd be a good boy he'd be protected by god so it can mean that the boys simply have to accept their mis- miserable fate and not question society's objectives while they simply do their duty no questions just go on working or does the poet mean us that is the readers us who we are reading who the people we are reading the poet poem now or at that point of time those readers the poet had targeted while he wanted to while, while he wrote this poem the people he wanted it to target so basically if we perform our basic duties if we are kind to the people around us or in that era if the, they behaved like true christians christians are, they say they are supposed to be very very kind in fact all religion preach kindness and non violence so if they behaved like true christians showing kindness to all making sure that no harm comes to adults and children alike including the chimney sweepers then they will never incur the wrath of god you know they will the ch- chimney sweepers will not fear harm on one level because they'll be looked after and secondly whatever was being done whatever laws were being passed whatever child labor was happening was happening all in the name of god the church was saying that it is all right god has sanctioned it god has accepted it it is god's will but after all god is not so unkind he looks after his children so he is the final judge and whatever he is is being done in his name if it is wrong it shall definitely not be taken kindly by him that is god on the final judgment day so it might also mean that people you the church who is doing who is coming up with all sorts of these kind of terrible labor laws in the name of god if you do your actual duty of being kind to everyone around you then you shall also expect to be forgiven or absolved of your sins by god you will not you know purge in purgatory god will not be angry with you so children even though the poem is spoken through the lips of a little child the message that it carries is very very adult in nature and this is what makes the poem more ironic than ever with this we conclude the poem and just in case if you were wondering finally a law came the factory act was passed as you can see it is the screenshot of a newspaper it's august 1st 1833 and this kind of abolished this terrible practice of child labor it said that no child workers under 9 years of age were acceptable employers must have an age certificate for the child workers you cannot just thrust a 6 year old and sit into work and say that yes he is 9 and he can work i need the money children of 9 to 13 years to work no more than 9 hours a day though it might seem terrible to you but for a person who is working 24 hours a day without wages for that person it is a bright and sunny thing to happen in his life children of 13 to 18 years would not work for more than 12 hours a day children are not to work at night and the best part 2 hours of schooling each day for all the children so somewhere at the end of the tunnel there is always light so 
children i hope you have understood the poem i have really liked teaching it to you discussing it with you take care